I'm Mitra. I'm a licensed tour guide in Italy and I'm a virtuoso travel advisor. Today I want to take you to one of the most beloved squares we have in all of Rome, Piazza Navona. Let's go! Navona is referred to as a Salone all'aperto, an outdoor living room. Due to the rather restricted living spaces, Romans have always taken to the piazzas in order to socialize, and today Piazza Navona is absolutely no exception. People would come here since their childhood, they come here and fare una passeggiata, o facciamo un giro. We take a walk or we take a turn. From Piazza Navona, it's a natural then walk all the way down to Campo di Fiori, cross the river and into Trastevere. So it gets quite full, especially on the weekends. Piazza Navona is also famous for having local resident artists in place. On one side of the fountain, you often find performers such as dancers, puppet men, and on the other side, you will find painters, watercolor, caricature, oil paintings, you name it. Piazza Navona was built in the 16th century in the great wave of papal restoration of Pope when they were transforming her from an imperial city into a papal one. But when you look at the signs of Piazza Navona, you often see written in brackets underneath the name Navona, Stadio di Domiziano, Domitian's Stadium. Emperor Domitian built the stadium in the first century AD. He comes from the same family as those who built the Colosseum, so the Flavinian dynasty. It was built in 8080 and it was mainly for athletic contests, gladiator battles, chariot races, and what have you. About 30,000 people could be seated on these seats in the stadium. And then in the 16th century, the Pope simply built on top of the stadium, building the buildings into the bleacher seats and shows still the shape of the original stadium in the shape of the plan of the piazza. That's why it's so very long and oval in shape. You can still go and visit the original underground level by exiting one of the shorthand sides of Piazza Navona. You pay a small fee and enter a partial excavation underneath, which is today an archaeological site and a small museum where you can go visit. In Piazza Navona, you also have three magnificent fountains, because what would a Roman piazza be without our fountains? Roman fountains may just look pretty, but that's not all they're here for. Fountains had a really important purpose, all the way from ancient Roman times all throughout to the 20th century. You see, less than 2% of people had drinking water in their own homes. They did not have plumbing. We start a big restoration of the historical centers of Europe after World War II pulling in plumbing into all the homes. Until then, people knew exactly what fountains to go to, to get drinking water for themselves, for their animals, or even to do laundry. There are some pictures of people doing laundry in some pretty famous fountains here in Rome back in the day. But here, the first two fountains that we start with on each further side end of Piazza Navona are both done by Giacomo della Porta in the 16th century. Pope Gregory XIII in the 1580s decided not only to reconnect aqueducts to restore water flow, but he planned an entire chain of over 15 fountains to be built in a short five-year span, all to simply improve drinking water conditions for the Romans. One of Giacomo della Porta's fountains is called Fountain of the Moor, and the other one is the Fountain of the Neptune. But the true star of Piazza Navona Square is the central fountain made by none other than Bernini. Gian Lorenzo Bernini was born in the year 1598 and was a natural heir to take over in a 30-year gap since Michelangelo's death. Bernini had a father who also was a sculptor, so he starts extremely young. He was only seven when he first assisted with his father, and in the Galleria Borghese you can see his first sculpture credited to him as an 11-year-old. Bernini worked for all the major popes. The 1600s were his. He owned this century as far as sculpture and architecture went. But amongst the popes and the noble families of Rome, there were very strife, deep-running political rivalries that one day would end up hurting Bernini's career. About halfway through the 1600s, we get a pope called Pope Innocent XI from the Pamphili family. He got elected and he was no friend of any former employer of Bernini's. So he decided he did not want to use him. However, he couldn't say this outright because this would have been a controversial decision at the time, seeing as Bernini was the most popular artist and the most in demand. He calls Bernini 
to his court saying, I just want to have a chat with you. And Bernie says, he's all eager, he comes. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Nothing, I just want to chat with you. They have a chit chat. And Bernini asks, could I do something for you, sire? Anything, could I build something for you? And Pope says, no, it's okay, I just want to talk. This keeps going on, now Bernini is a very busy man with hundreds of students. In fact, in Rome, there is a saying that if Bernini had worked on all his commission works by himself, he'd still be working and he would still not be finished. So here he is taking time for the Pope and the Pope is seemingly uninterested in any of his servants. So he's getting a little agitated, if you so will. So after a while, Bernini says, Your Holiness, surely there must be something that I can do for you. I can do anything you possibly want. And the Pope says, surely not anything. Anything you want, you name it. And the Pope says, well, there was this one thing I was thinking, but I thought maybe it was too difficult. Bernini gets deeply offended at this and says, sire, I assure you, absolutely anything and everything that you can dream of, I will do it for you. And the Pope says, good. I want you to build bell towers on the St. Peter's Basilica. And Bernini gets paler than the marble that he's used to sculpting in simply because he was the closing architect of St. Peter's Basilica and after 120 years, not a single architect had put bell towers onto St. Peter's. Why? It's all built on marshland. Everyone knew the ground could not take it. Even securing the base of the dome had been quite an enterprise in itself. But Bernini had just said in front of everyone that he could do anything the Pope possibly asked. So he essentially walked straight into this trap. So Bernini tries, and it's not that he doesn't try. He mixes cement in every kind of innovative variant he can possibly come up with, but he won't get more than halfway up, and the columns show fissures. They start to crack. The Pope accuses him of embezzlement, using inferior materials, and the scandal is a given. How dare Bernini try to embezzle the Pope? And this was the end of his career, seemingly, at that moment. Having to pay for the dismantling from his own pockets, he almost went bankrupt at the process. If the Pope won't hire you, I promise you nobody else is going to hire you either. And then shortly after, fairly pleased with himself, the Pope will now announce a competition to be held in Rome. He wants to build a fountain in the center of Piazza Navona, of such glory as had never seen before. And everyone could enter, he said. Everyone except Bernini. So way to humiliate a guy even further, huh? making sure that you know that even apprentices are more valuable than you are in the eyes of this Pope. But Bernini doesn't just take this rolling down. You see, he's really good friends with the niece of the Pope, a woman so powerful that her nickname in Rome was the Popes. She, according to the legend here in Rome, according to her contacts and her money, is the whole reason her uncle got elected into the papacy and people used to go visit her before they even saw the Pope. Her and Bernini are great friends. There are some stories that allegedly claim that he seduced her. I'm not going to swear on it, but that's what the gossip said. Either way, he gave her a gift, a five foot, a meter and a half sterling silver fountain that he put in the hallway of her house. As you entered, that was the first thing you saw. So fast forward a few days later, the Pope walks in, he stops dead in his tracks and he asks his niece, what is that? Where did you get that? pretending she has no idea what he's talking about oh that she says I don't know a friend of mine he's an artist he just dropped it by why do you like it like, do you like do I like it it's magnificent why isn't your friend entering my competition she said oh surely it's not that great do you think so he said it's amazing tell your friend that he's going to enter my competition I promise I will build his fountain you promise? You swear? I mean, I don't want to get his hopes up. I swear, on the Holy Cross. Now tell me who is your friend. Oh, it's Bernini. It is said that the Pope after this said that the only way not to build anything by Bernini was not to lay eyes on it to begin with. And in 1654, triumphantly, Bernini re-enters the popularity on stage once again as the most sought-after sculptor and also in favor of the papacy himself making the fountain of the four rivers. The fountain of the four rivers is referred to as Quattro Fiumi in Italian. The four rivers represent the four continents of the world. I know, we have seven, but in the 17th century, we only knew about four. Europe, Asia, the Americas, and Africa. It is the Americas because at this point in history, North America had gone all Protestant anyway, so the Catholic Church simply decided they got to be one continent. 
the four river gods representing the four different continents, starting with the Nile, Africa. The statue of Africa is covering his head. Several reasons for this. There wasn't too much clarity about the original positioning of the Nile, and there still isn't today. It comes up from somewhere near Lake Victoria, but where its deep origins are, we don't quite know. Also, Bernini decides to place palm trees on the side because all the palm trees in Rome have been imported from the North African coastline in imperial times some two millenniums ago. And then there's a lion leaning down and drinking down from the water. The first time Romans ever saw lions were in the Colosseum games in the first century AD. Allegedly, a hundred lions and a hundred lionesses were released into the arena at the same time in the Colosseum and their combined roar was so mighty that the entire stadium of 74,000 spectators went completely quiet. And that's why you see a lion in the fountain. Then we have the continent of Asia. The river god Ganges is steering down with his oar, going down the big river, a life-giving river, has leaves on his head from plants growing specifically by the Ganges River. We go over to the Danube River, representing Europe, sea monsters of different kinds representing by his feet. This specific sea monster, the foot of Danube, however, is actually engineeringly a very clever solution. All the water exiting from the fountain goes out through its mouth. As you start going towards the last statue in the fountain, you're going to pass by a big horse inside there. No specific symbolism, but he was one of the most famous race horses of the time, so he definitely earned his spot right there. Our last continent represented in the fountain is Rio de la Plata of the Americas. But when you look at the statue and you look at his profile, his body build, he doesn't look particularly indigenous, but he does look like he's of African descent. Look at his ankle and you'll see an anklet around it, and the coins next to it are all the giveaway signs that you're looking at an enslaved African. Slavery was a very controversial topic in Europe of the 16 to the 1700s. Not going to lie to you and tell you that slavery wasn't something that European market profited off in a third party kind of way because plenty of it did and we have had plenty of colonizing. But in this specific time era, it was a controversial topic of how keeping enslaved humans was moral or humane. However, the king and queen of Spain, Isabella and Ferdinand, being devout Catholics, sent one tenth of their riches to the Pope in Rome. So here in Rome, they would have seen African slaves being sent with big trays of silver as they were mined the silver mines all throughout South America. So Bernini leaves an enslaved African as a symbol of the Americas in his fountain. In the middle of the fountain, you will see an obelisk. And while it has hieroglyphs on it, you should know they are as fake as they can get. The obelisk is Egyptian, but the hieroglyphs are fake. We did not realize this until the Rosetta Stone was found and we started to decipher it in the 20th century. But when they read it, they were quite confused because all they kept talking about was one certain Domitian and may he have 1,000 sons and be blessed by the gods for an eternity to come. And funny thing is, they're talking about the very Emperor Domitian that built the original stadium. But Bernini had found this obelisk several miles away from here, broken in pieces, simply fused it together and put it in the fountain. So without knowing it, he returned the obelisk back to its original position. On top of the obelisk here, there is a dove with an olive branch in its beak and that is a symbol of the Pamphili family who ordered the building of this fountain. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to learn more about Rome's piazzas, monuments and fountains, subscribe to this channel. If you want to travel here and experience this all by yourself, don't hesitate in reaching out to me. Remember, if you dream it, me as your travel advisor, I will deliver it. Ciao!